they are some of the world's most notorious killers. He enjoyed inflicting pain on people. But were these psychopaths born evil, or did their mothers make them into monsters? I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm in a quest to explore how some of history's most notorious murderers were molded by their relationships with their mother. When you've got somebody who has been described as the mother from hell, that's not going to be an easy relationship for the child and the parent. I'll be piecing together events from their childhood and talking to criminologists and psychologists to try and understand what motivated their monstrous crimes. 53 stab wounds is beyond what I've experienced in my career. In this episode... Cinema owner Peter Moore was a local hero in this sleepy North Wales community. But he hid a secret violent side. His mother worshipped him all her life. And when she died, he went on a killing spree, taking the lives of four men. Did his mother turn him into a serial killer? For the vast majority of us, the thought of taking another's life is simply unimaginable. And while some of us may understand in part murders driven by greed, rage or jealousy, the thought of someone just killing for fun is the stuff of nightmares. But there is a tiny handful of people who actually enjoy the act of killing. And Peter Moore was one of them. Nestling on the north coast of Wales, Across the bay from the popular resort of Rill is Kimmel Bay. It's a small, close-knit community whose inhabitants live a gentle, slow-paced life. But in the 1990s, a killer lived amongst them. Businessman Peter Moore was well known locally as the successful owner of four cinemas. But behind his facade of respectability, he conducted a gruesome double life. Undetected for decades, Moore carried out brutal sexual attacks on dozens of men, culminating in four extremely savage murders. I've been a policeman for a long time, uh, over 30 years, and uh, I met a lot of bad people, a lot of mad people in my time. But I believe that Peter is the most dangerous man that I've ever met in my life. He actually enjoyed inflicting pain on people because at some level it made him feel powerful. He felt merciless in terms of his, his feelings towards the victim and, and totally callous and he had no conscience whatsoever. I've come to North Wales, where Peter Moore lived and where he murdered four men. I want to delve into his family background, his relationship with his parents, and in particular, his adoring mother, to find out exactly what it was that made him into a murderer. Peter Moore was born in St. Helens, Cheshire, on the 19th of September, 1940. When still very young, he moved with his parents, Ernest and Edith, to Kimmel Bay. This is Darlington House, now an unremarkable looking bike shop. It was once the largest building in the area, and the Moors lived a comfortable existence here above the hardware store they owned and operated. This bike showroom was the former flat where the Moore family grew up. And when Edith Moore fell pregnant, she'd all but given up any hope of having children. When young Peter was born, she called him her miracle baby. Her son became the center of her world, and she was utterly devoted to him. Growing up, Peter always knew he had his mother's undivided attention. In her eyes, he could do no wrong, but he was just as infatuated with her as she was with him. Peter Moore's mother 
was someone who'd had miscarriages, is someone who really given up on having children and more or less never expected to bear a child. When Peter came along, however, she was absolutely delighted. Though Edith was overjoyed by the birth of her son, Moore was not born into a happy home. I think she was lonely. I mean, her husband never spent any time with her, as far as what I could tell. Um, I don't think that he would have shown a great deal of um, affection or tenderness. But once she had a son, that was what she needed. I think for only children, it can be very difficult for them to be out of the spotlight, if you like. And especially in this context where it, the, the household wasn't a happy household. I think when I first met Peter, he was, um, he was different to other boys. Um, he was always with his mum. He was very close to his mum. They used to always be doing the garden together. And if Mrs. Moore came out to talk to my mum or dad, um, Peter would always be at her side, um, which always seemed a little bit unusual. As Moore grew into adolescence, those that knew him described him as rather effeminate. His father, a hard-drinking, traditional, former military man, was not impressed. He didn't approve of Peter's um, flimsiness. He wanted him to be a man, but Peter wasn't the type of man that his dad wanted him to be. Mr. Moore liked to drink. He would have a drink during the day. And my dad warned me not to spend time with Peter Moore's dad alone. Peter did tell me that his, his father had been violent towards him as, as, a, as a child. Um, he, he didn't go into any detail, but it was, it was quite apparent that him and his father had a, had a violent relationship. And I think his mother was the, uh, was the sort of protection between the, the, the two men. The fact that his mother doted on Peter and that Peter doted on his mother would have probably further aggravated his father. I think their relationship, to some degree, was doomed from the start. Despite this difficult relationship with his father, Moore knew he was at the centre of his mother's universe, and that made him feel special. He was growing up in one of the largest homes in Kimmel Bay, where the income from the shop meant the family were more affluent than most others in the community. This added to Moore's growing sense that he was unique and perhaps better than other people. Mrs. Moore, Edith, felt that she was lady of the, the manor, you know, lady of Kimmel Bay. She, because they had the big house, uh, she was very proud of that. Early on in his upbringing, Peter Moore became fascinated with films and filmmaking. And since his parents were quite well off, they bought him a cine camera. And as he moved from childhood to adolescence, he started to document his family life through the lens of an eight millimeter camera. Right from the very start, there was no doubting who was the leading lady and central star of his home movies. Edith's miracle child repaid the love he received from her by making her the heroine in a string of home movies. If his mother was the star, Peter Moore was the movie mogul, calling the shots. It was an early indication that he seemed to think that the story of his life, including his terrible crimes, should be projected onto the silver screen. Peter Moore was very much obsessed with making films. It was a privilege in a way, because not many families had cine cameras. Um, he enjoyed the idea of being theatrical. He enjoyed this kind of constructing of, a, of an imaginary world. It allowed him to escape uh, the rather grim world that his father imposed on him. And it allowed him to fantasize a little. These never before seen home movies, shot by a young Moor, 
find him documenting his neighbours and his local community in the 1960s. Filming gives you control over the narrative. You've got lots more power to make it the way you want to make it. You colour it in for yourself. Moore's childhood relationship with his mother was close to complete infatuation. She was devoted to him and he worshipped her. But was Edith Moore already turning her son into a monster? To try and find out what part she played, I'm meeting criminologist Dr. Elizabeth Yardley. How significant was it that Edith, uh, Peter Moore's mother, was having trouble conceiving and then she had, after a great deal of work, Peter? I think this was really significant because she'd been trying to, to have a child for some time. I think she'd almost kind of resigned herself to the fact that it was something that wasn't going to happen. He feels incredibly privileged. His mother is always telling him that, that he is her, her little miracle. So he's got that sense in which he feels incredibly entitled from quite a young age. And we see the sense of entitlement. He gets a cine camera uh, in his early childhood. And you think back in those days, a cine camera, it's so out of place in that community. This is really significant, isn't it? This is, is quite an expensive piece of technology, quite an advanced thing to have at the time. But then again, you know, he's Peter, he's entitled to, to have the things that, that he wants because he's special, because he's the only child, because they waited so long to have him. But it's not just the fact he has this piece of technology, it's what he does with it as well. So he makes a lot of home movies and the star of these home movies is, of course, his mother. As we go on the journey with Peter Moore and his mother, we know the seeds of their relationship and the seeds of that pathology, what made him into a murderer started from day one. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing in this case because Peter already feels quite special within his own family because he's the only child. So I think that does kind of sow the seeds for um, a little bit of a kind of narcissistic element to his personality. We're seeing somebody who's had a lot of attention heaped on him by his mother, somebody who sees himself as above others, and, and I think those are some of those ingredients that we often see when we look back at, at serial killers' early childhoods. In the 1990s, Peter Moore brutally murdered four men. An only child, he had an unnaturally close relationship with his mother, but despised his overbearing father. He cut a distinctive, somewhat odd figure in the small church-going community of Kimmel Bay in North Wales. I would say it was different, but there was something about Peter, uh, the way he used to dress when I used to see him out as, uh, as a teenager. He would be always dressed in black. I think it was because he wanted to stand out, wanted to be noticed. This used to be Peter Moore's room, and growing up he was at the centre of his mother's universe. Even in adolescence, they spent most of their time together. But Moore's relationship with his own father was very different. Moore's father resented the fact that Peter wasn't like other boys. He was a bit of a wimp. He was effeminate. He was a mommy's boy. Worst of all, in his eyes, he suspected that the young Peter might be gay. In 1950s Britain, being gay was still against the law. So it wouldn't have been just his father he needed to conceal his sexual identity from. At the time when Peter Moore was a child, homosexuality was illegal and very much frowned on and very much confined to gents' toilets and hidden places. In terms of hiding this from the general public, Peter wasn't that bothered providing it didn't get back to his mother. My opinion would be that if she was aware that he was gay, 
It was something that was probably never discussed within the family environment. It was something that was um, probably the, the elephant in the room that was never discussed, if you know what I mean. The need for Peter Moore to keep his sexuality hidden and a secret was because there was such a stigma um, and such an awareness on his part um, that uh, in order to function as best he could within his family and in the community, um, this part of his uh, identity uh, had to be completely disguised. While his mother was still alive and because he lived in a conservative and close-knit community, he decided to keep his sexuality a closely guarded secret. But as the years went by, he found sinister and peculiar ways of satisfying his sexual appetite. With gay sex still illegal, it wasn't unusual for homosexual men like Moore to cruise for partners at night. What was unusual was that he began a series of vicious assaults on the men he stalked. Moore was always dressed in his trademark dark clothing that later saw him dubbed the Man in Black. Generally, the, the majority of attacks were low male. I'd been to the local, local pub for, for a beer and walking, walking back home. He would, he would drive ahead, park up, and then hide himself in the bushes. As, as the male walked past, uh, he, would, he would jump out of the bushes, normally with a rubber, rubber truncheon, and attack the, attack the males from behind, and then there would be some form of a, a sort of sexual assault take place thereafter. Moore would later admit that these attacks had continued undetected for 20 years, and that he derived sexual pleasure from the violence. Each attack ended with Moore urinating and masturbating on his victims. Urinating and masturbating on his victims um, gives him a sense of sadistic power uh, over them, which is a reversal um, of his early experience at the hands of his father, who had sadistic power over him, uh, where he was the victim and felt humiliated. Though Moore was viewed as an oddball by many in the community, no one who knew him imagined he could be capable of such vicious attacks. I don't remember seeing anything at all that would have made me suspicious uh, of Peter. I would always have a chat with him, but I, I was never aware of him being violent, and I don't remember anybody ever saying he'd been violent or they knew of any violence involving Peter. No, I can't think of anything like that. When he was 33, his domineering father died and Moore took over the running of the family hardware shop. Well, I think Peter's dad's death affected Peter in um, a way that made Peter become more forceful, stronger, stronger-willed. I think it took away his dependence on his dad. He took over the shop and his confidence grew. Throughout the 1980s, Moore managed to keep the family hardware business afloat. And all the while, he lived here with his mother in Darlington House. And locals would note that although he was now an adult, Edith, his mother, would continue to dote on him as if he was still a little boy. Every one of us, when we when, when turned at the shop premises, would have to go to the private living quarters at the back of the shop and, and meet his mother and have a chat with her and sometimes a cup of tea just to sort of pass the time of day and let her know what was going on. There was photos in the living area of Peter in his school uniform really, in his short trousers and school caps and she spoke to him as if he was still the, the, the schoolboy and he would just sort of laugh it off but uh, you could see he, he, he wasn't embarrassed by it, he just knew that was his mother's way and he was happy. He was the child that she never thought she would have and I think she wanted him to remain her child forever. Despised by his late father, Moore seemed to have taken refuge in his mother's love, though it didn't stop him conducting his violent double life by night. His mother provided all of that adoration that he felt he was in, entitled to. He's getting everything from it. He's getting love and adoration and protection and he doesn't seem to be 
worried about that. He doesn't, he doesn't feel claustrophobic. Psychologically, in his mind, he's continuing um, in this very enmeshed relationship with his mother, who, um, uh, but it's important, whilst he continues to be in this enmeshed relationship with his mother, um, that he has control over father. It's a fantasy control over father, um, and it's revenge against father um, in the activities where he uh, uh, then starts to abuse other men. In 1990, while still operating the hardware store, Moore decided to embark on a new venture that would incorporate his love of film. He decided to renovate an old cinema in a nearby town. It was to be the first of four cinemas that he would own and operate, the final one being this one here behind me in Hollyhead. He was considered a hero, with the local news hailing him as the saviour of North Wales cinemas. It earned him a great deal of kudos and respect. When I met him, and in the two or three years I had dealings with him while the shop was open, uh, I think he was struggling to make ends meet. He was trying different things, uh, trying different ventures. He had, um, he had the uh, video library upstairs for a while. The shop went down and down, his business went down. Then he took over the cinemas, and he was busy doing those up. Um, and his mother was proud of that. As boss of his own cinemas, Moore often chose to screen violent horror films, Friday the 13th starring the evil Jason being one of his favourites. His audiences had no idea that Moore's own nocturnal secret life was far more terrifying and savage than anything up on the screen. Moore was the sadist who enjoyed inflicting pain on other men for his own sexual gratification. After hours at a cinemas, he started to put on live S&M shows for a small select audience. All the while, he kept his own sexuality hidden from public view, and most importantly, from his doting mother, Edith. He seemed to be leading a normal life daytime, but he started to go out at night in much in the same way that his dad used to do. He'd go off at night and nobody would know where he, where he was, what he was up to. Peter Moore never really established any kind of real adult relationships. He discovered bit by bit that he was sexually sadistic. He had to inflict pain and suffering in order to gain any sexual arousal. And this he would either organise uh, with other men, or he would actually go out there increasingly and take it. Did Moore's parents and the need to hide his sexuality influence his increasingly deviant behaviour? I've come to meet criminologist Dr Elizabeth Yardley to find out. I, I suspect very early on his mother would have recognised that he was gay and that would have intensified their relationship. I think potentially she would have felt even more protective towards him um, because here is this, this wonderful son who she waited so many years for um, and, and he, it turns out that he is gay and, and that's something else that makes him special, something else that makes him unique perhaps. It's something that's hidden and I think that's a theme that continues throughout Peter Moore's life. But the primary force I'm suspecting in the marriage, in the family, is now it's the mother and Peter and uh, that causing and that affection and uber attention rather than the ridicule and abuse he was getting from the father. Well, I think it's a combination of the two. So within the same household, you've got all of this love and affection and support from your mother, yet at the same time, your father really can't stand the sight of you because you are not living up to the expectations of, of what he wanted you to be. But where is this fantasy, this need to dominate his sexual partners? Where has that come from? I mean, I feel that it's coming from his, his mother, and I'm just wondering just how was that expressed? How do you explain it? Well, if, if you look at what he's trying to achieve, he's trying to achieve power, he's trying to achieve control, and where does that come from? I think that comes from a sense of entitlement 
that kind of narcissistic characteristic that's, that's often laid in motion in somebody's very early years. Peter Moore was the sadistic sexual killer of four men in the 1990s, viciously assaulting and humiliating dozens more. After the death of his father, he continued to live with his doting mother, Edith. But that year, saw a cataclysmic change in Moore's life. In May 1994, Edith, Moore's mother, passed away, leaving him all alone here at Darlington House. Her death left him heartbroken, and he became increasingly introverted. He's lost the person that was probably the most important person in his life. And gradually, he became more and more reclusive. Um, and then people would, you sort of, hear conversations, I don't know what Peter's up to, you know. He doesn't seem to be the same, it's a shame. The effect of this bereavement on Moore was profound. I think that the death of his mother took away the only thing that could potentially have kept this under control. And I only say potentially. She was what in criminological terms we call an intimate handler, and that just means somebody there to stop you when it goes too far. When Peter Moore's mother died, the level of control, that genteel control, and that fundamentally uh, adoring relationship between them ended. He wanted to do things, he had motivations, and all of a sudden, there was absolutely no reason why he shouldn't just get on with it. With his mother gone, Moore became less guarded about his sexuality. He would regularly bring men back to Darlington House for sadomasochistic sex sessions, where he'd dress up in black leathers and beat his sexual partners. When his mother died, he just became more reclusive. There was a lot of comings and goings at Darlington House in the early hours of the morning. To make matters worse, Moore's cinema businesses were struggling financially, and his personal life began to spiral out of control. He later described to police how the desire to kill would grow within him. He would describe to me that when he was feeling the, the, the urge to kill, the need to, to, to commit a murder, he would go into a zone and he would describe how he would be looking uh, through what he describes as zigzags either side of his, his sort of peripheral vision. So every, everything he was just focused on what he was looking at and everything else was like yellow and black stripes. In September 1995, Moore was working to restore one of his cinemas in Hollyhead. While traveling between work and home, he continued to look for men to attack. One night, his search for ever more violent sexual gratification came to a murderous climax. Henry Roberts was a quiet 56-year-old man who lived in this house here on the island of Anglesey, about an hour's drive from Kimmel Bay. Peter would, would drive back from the cinema in Hollyhead, back to um, his home in Kimmel Bay, uh, late at night along the A5 road, the old A5 road as it was then, and he would see Henry walking from the public house back towards his home address. And he told me that the idea of killing somebody was sort of in, in his head and he decided that Henry would be a good, likely candidate really to be his first victim. Robert, like Moore, was gay and had a penchant for Nazi memorabilia. On the 23rd of September, Moore drove to Henry Robert's house. It's not clear if it was a pre-arranged meeting, but we do know that on the night in question, Moore arrived armed with a knife. He was stabbed numerous times in, across his back and, and across his back of his legs. And um, f following his, his death, his, his, his trousers were, were lowered and he was stabbed post-mortem twice in, in each buttock. 
Moore stabbed Henry Roberts 47 times. It was beyond brutal. Roberts had been a regular at his local pub. When he didn't show up for three days, friends took a walk up to his house where they found his body. He'd been dead for two days. In Peter Moore's first murder, the word overkill is probably a very good description. And the final two stabs, in fact, were post-mortem, so are far more symbolic. So perhaps moved beyond the frenzy and the rage and the final symbolic act of, of stabbing this victim in the buttocks, taking his trousers down, another humiliation, um, was perhaps more to do with his gay feelings. Peter Moore's approach to killing his victims was one of a sexual sadist, gaining satisfaction primarily. Killing the victim was almost incidental, part, if you like, of the process. Primarily, he was gaining sexual satisfaction from inflicting the most ultimate harm that you can on another human being. Despite committing this gruesome murder, Moore keeps up the appearance of being a successful businessman and pillar of the community. He is seen as usual around town, always dressed in a signature all-black outfit. No one suspected a thing. Peter Moore clearly demonstrated uh, significant psychopathic tendencies. The psychopathic uh, tendencies are demonstrated clearly by the fact that his total disregard for the consequences of his actions and the experience of his victims. They were merely individuals that he was going to be using to further his own narcissistic aims. Moore had now developed a taste for murder. And just a few weeks later, he struck again. His victim was 49-year-old security guard Keith Randalls, who was living in a caravan on a construction site in Anglesey. This time, he decided to kill Keith for his own amusement. He told me that, uh, once again, he was, uh, he was driving from the cinema in Hollyhead back towards Kimmel Bay. It has been now a month since he'd, he'd killed Henry, and obviously he hadn't, hadn't been sort of interviewed or arrested for it, and he was feeling the um, the need to kill again. So he, he, he told me that he, on the way home, he decided to drive around a bit and see if there was any likely candidates. According to Moore's later testimony, he knocked on the door of Randall's caravan and was ready with a knife in hand as he answered. Peter told me they just stabbed him, once straight into the stomach region. Uh, Keith came out of the caravan and um, a, a big struggle ensued. Quite, quite, uh, it was quite a sort of massive struggle and, and Keith was certainly fighting for his life. Peter told me that uh, at some stage during the, the, the fight, um, Keith turned to uh, Peter and sort of begged for his life for the sake of his grandchildren. But that had no effect and Keith said to him, why are you doing this to me? And he turned around and replied to him, I'm doing it for fun. He wanted to portray something, he wanted to be the centre of attention. And I think saying, just for fun, would actually push him into the kind of um, legion of serial killers and the kind of phrases they come out with uh, because it sounds like something that would happen in a film. After the murder, Moore calmly drove home where he realised that in the struggle, he'd lost a black clip-on tie. He returned immediately to the scene of the crime, retrieved the tie, and stole a video recorder from the caravan. Released from the need to answer to his beloved mother, Moore's lustful desire to kill appeared to be in overdrive. I want to ask criminologist Dr. Elizabeth Yardley 
how far Edith may have restrained her son's murderous urges. The death of Edith, Peter Moore's mother, was seismic. Is that the trigger for his move from being a sexual predator to being a serial killer? Mm. It had a, a massive impact on him because she is his number one fan. She's always been the person there in the background who's providing him with reassurance and, and basically stroking the developing ego um, that, that, that he was. And for her not to be there, he's now lost that. And I think that's an important part of somebody's identity when, when they are quite narcissistic. That person who stands there and reinforces them and, and pats them on the head and says, aren't you fantastic? When that person's removed from the equation, that can get quite interesting. And his first victim was Henry Roberts. He tells us this was nearly an opportunistic act. And yet I'm not convinced, Liz. I think what we're looking at here is access and opportunity. I think Peter Moore is somebody who had been, been stalking people for, for quite some time, because you'll, you'll often find with killers like Moore that they won't just go straight into to killing, that they'll often do test runs, they'll practice, they'll try things out. We've always got to be so cautious about the stories that serial killers tell us about their crimes, because they will always want to present these stories in a particular way. Uh, and I, I do think this, this wasn't completely opportunistic. The murder of Keith Randalls, this, according to Peter Moore himself, was just for kicks, just for fun. And I don't accept that. He's creating a character here of this, this ruthless killer who kind of gets off on, on killing and has fun doing it. And I think we've always got to be really sceptical of, of any claims that he makes in relation to his killing. To my mind, there's still a sexual motive for uh, all these murders. When you think about what sex represents, it represents power, it represents control, all of the things that, that Peter Moore wants. Serial killer Peter Moore, dubbed the Man in Black, spent two decades carrying out vicious assaults on men for his own sexual gratification. But when his adored mother died, he escalated to sexually sadistic murder, stabbing his victims in a frenzy before defiling their bodies. After killing and getting away with it, he was getting bolder, and a week before Christmas in 1995, he struck again. On this occasion, his victim was 35-year-old father of two, Tony Davies. Davies, on the 18th of December, traveled seven miles from his home in Conway Bay to visit his mother in Abergele. After spending some time with her there, he told her he was just gonna pop out for a while. He never returned. The next day, his body was found here on Pensarn Beach. He'd been stabbed to death. The murder was committed at a well-known cottaging spot close to Moore's home at Darlington House. I think ultimately the fact that he, he was becoming blasé uh, was, was one, of, one of the two things he either wanted to be caught or was becoming so confident in his ability to kill um, that he could actually kill on his own doorstep and get away with it. This recklessness was to be Moore's undoing. A hotline had been set up asking the gay community to sort of offer some information in relation to what happens on Pennsylvania Beach that might help us in the investigation. I, I received an action um, that, uh, late in the evening um, from somebody that called in on the, on the hotline and described that um, this male had met a man on Pennsylvania Beach and been taken to an address in Kimball Bay where he'd been attacked and he, he described himself as being lucky to get away with his life. He gave a very sort of loose description of, of, the, of the property and its location. I immediately recognised the house to be Darlington House. I knew that Darlington House was, was owned and, and still owned by Peter Moore. And I knew that obviously Peter was a, a gay man. The man described in the tip-off was dressed head to toe in black. And I remembered that previously I had seen him dressed in black leather jacket and black leather trousers. So I, sort of, I formed the impression that um, Peter would be, is a, was a good suspect. Convinced that Peter Moore was the murderer the police were looking for, DC David Morris led two teams of officers to his home at Darlington House. But as they approached, they saw Moore 
driving away in the opposite direction. They tailed him for almost five miles before he pulled into a housing estate. As soon as Moore stepped out of the car, police arrested him. He was taken to Clandidno police station for questioning. I think when I arrested him, I think Peter did know who I was. It was only when I went into the interview room that I introduced myself and, um, and mentioned the fact that I'd met him before and met his mother. And I think he was quite pleased that I remembered him. With Moore under arrest, police were sent to search Darlington House. There they discovered Tony Davies' coat and the video recorder belonging to Keith Randalls. Peter Moore was charged with the murder of Tony Davies and arrested on suspicion of the murder of Keith Randalls. Late that night, DC David Morris was called at home and was asked urgently to go to the police station. I received a phone call about um, 2, 2.30 in the morning from the Custody Street in Llandino saying that uh, Peter had come back from the court and requested a further interview. So I made my way back to Slandidna and um, I'm going to say, you've asked for an interview, what do you want to tell us? It was then that Moore dropped a bombshell. So we made our way into the interview room in Slandidna about 4, 4.30 in the morning. Uh, myself, my colleague, um, Peter and his solicitor. And uh, during the course of that interview, he admitted to us uh, four murders, the three murders that we were aware of in North Wales from September through to Christmas of 1995, a murder that we were unaware of, the murder of Edward Carthy. Moore had picked up 28-year-old Edward Carthy at a gay club in Liverpool and offered him a lift home. He told me that as he drove through the Birkenhead Tunnel from Liverpool back towards Birkenhead, Edward had fallen asleep in, in the cab of the Ford Transit, and that's when he formed the impression that Edward was somebody that he could kill and that he was going to kill him. So as Edward slept, he drove him to, to North Wales uh, and to the woods where he, he, he got him out of the vehicle and stabbed him to death. Moore even drew a map which enabled the police to find Carthy's body. A seemingly unrepentant Moore appeared to draw satisfaction from revealing the grisly details of his murders. He was finally the star in his own film, and people were watching. The fact that his, um, uh, his starring role was coming to an end, um, on the one hand would have been a relief, but paradoxically would have uh, even enhanced his sense that he was now firmly in the public eye, and he really was uh, a, a star. But then, in a bizarre twist, while on remand in prison, Moore recanted his confession and claimed the murders were committed by a friend of his named Jason. So we came to the interview room and picked up the interviews again, and it was during that sort of week, week in custody in, in Walton Prison that um, he had a sort of change of heart and, and decided to tell us that he wasn't a murderer in actual fact, it was his friend who he nicknamed, nicknamed Jason. I was interested about his use of Jason. I've seen it before with other serial killers um, or mass killers. Um, uh, and that is uh, that they, um, uh, they get their sort of narrative reference um, from uh, fictional characters. At his trial, Moore angered and upset the families of his victims by playing up to the cameras and appearing to enjoy himself. The way that he behaved in front of the press was like he was a rock star of serial killing. This is probably how he wanted to be remembered. The reason that he performs to the cameras is one of the clearest indicators that he is still defending against the reality and very firmly entrenched in a world of fantasy, uh, that he continues to be the star. It's a defensive, a dynamic against accepting the reality of his life. Throughout the proceedings, Moore maintained his innocence and continued to blame the mysterious Jason. 
This was a case of too weird, too late, and not credible. He didn't fool anybody, police, judge, jury, anyone. Um, Peter Moore, in fact, was clearly Jason. Moore was found guilty on all four counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison. I still find it hard to believe that he turned into a murderer. I, I find it hard to believe that he could be that person. Moore was finally the star of his own grisly show. Is it possible that a doting mother's love could be at the root of his crimes? What kind of mother do you think Edith Moore was? I think for me, um, what Edith is, is an uber mother. She's an exaggerated performance of the role of the mother. She's concentrating her efforts on one child. It's a child that she's waited a long time for. So, so her mothering is such a central part of her identity. But I think increasingly now, what we're starting to see when we look at, at, at some cases of, of murder, is that the, the mother in the background is, is this, this figure who is, you know, over kind of uh, attached, somebody who, who really does kind of overperform the role of the mother rather than underperform it. So I think too much mothering is just as bad as too little mothering. I think it's not trite to say, but I think when it comes to the making of murderers, mothers matter more. She was the star in his movies. He was the star in his movies. They both were playing roles. And to what extent do you sense that he was living out a performance, that he'd, he set himself out to be the star ultimately in his own courtroom drama? I think that's very much the case. And, and cinema and performance were always something that was very important for, for Peter Moore. He's always performing a role and he's always anticipating an audience. And he, he gets that audience when he's charged with these murders and he, he ends up in court. And he's almost really lavishing in the attention. It's this idea of the serial killer as celebrity. Uh, and I think that's something that, that we see very much uh, performed by Peter Moore. Peter Moore's crimes were those of a sadistic killer. He enjoyed inflicting physical pain on others for his own sexual gratification. For over 20 years, he sexually assaulted dozens of men who he knew would be too ashamed to report the attacks. And when this no longer sated his sexual appetite, he decided to break the ultimate taboo, murder. <laughs> 